quite daunting to stand here, but uh, I'll try to do my best. Um, MVRDV is an architecture office uh, founded in the Netherlands, and we, we refuse to become specialists in just one thing. We want to have a very wide uh, portfolio. So this is one of our smallest projects ever, a glass kitchen. It's not very practical, you have to clean it a lot, but uh, it shows that we don't... Uh, but we're not afraid of small things. We also do holiday homes, like this one in Britain, or public buildings, uh, China, uh, sometimes creative offices in, uh, in Amsterdam. This was built for less than 1,000 euro, which in Western Europe is crazy, like uh, less than 1,000 euro per, per square meter. We also have a think tank at Delft University where we dream about the city of the future, of course, a green future. And uh, we like to think also in really large scale, uh, so we work on, uh, on large urban projects there. And data, data crunching, that's what we love to do. We love to play with data and make them visible somehow. Generally, uh, we're really concerned with the planet and also with uh, uh, the effect that we have on it, like urban sprawl is really something that we are very good at in the Netherlands, so we, we produce a lot of that. And we also think we have to actually solve it. Um, Urban density is, of course, really sustainable, but then who would want to live like that? That's really stressful. So our dream is to combine those two things. So you have the, the comfort of suburban homes uh, stacked on top of each other right next to the opera in the city center. So that's the dream. And uh, since uh, 25 years, that's what we're trying to do. I'll show you some of that. Um, of course, we transform the planet as we speak. We just heard a very nice presentation about this. Uh, we knew that, uh, this already for a long time. Since the 70s, there was this warning that, uh, that it's going to happen, and now it's uh, happening. We also grew up with this uh, knowledge that, yeah, that technology can actually be part of the solution. And uh, there's more and more technology coming up. But as the warnings get much uh, heavier uh, and more frequent and urgent, at the same time, um, the building industry is not really reforming. So how can you do that? And I think we just saw a, a wonderful example how it's possible. And uh, we're trying every time to do something. How do you transform construction? Well, we also made a, uh, um, a publication called The Green Dream, where we uh, discuss everything uh, sustainable, all the labels and so on. It's a very big um, publication, so I'm not going to show too much of that actually. But one of the things is a bit provocative, maybe that green buildings are quite ugly. And why is that? Because they, they attach stuff to buildings, like here in Bochum, in Germany. This is probably not how we're going to win the Green Revolution. Um, also, sometimes uh, there is this consensus that uh, we have to have 35% uh, glass only, which leads to really dark buildings. And we also just learned that that's not a good thing. So how to do it better? So we try to make really remarkable buildings that uh, sometimes just scream out loud that they are sustainable and that they recreate uh, um, artificial nature. But sometimes we also make buildings that are the contrary. So here you see a glass house. Inside there is a book mountain. It's an advertisement for reading. Built for a very small and not too rich uh, community in the Netherlands. And it's a glass house, and normally this is one of the worst things you can do in terms of sustainable technology, but it was solved, and it's one of the most sustainable buildings on a budget, on a very small budget. So it is possible. You can actually get away from these uh, yeah, rules about sustainability and do something innovative and new. And we're also building the first smart city of the Netherlands, and uh, it's not just smart, it's not just digital, it's also green. It is uh, circular. It is an energy neutral city and we're going to open it in 2022. And what we do here is that we um, actually merge the nature with the building, with uh, healthy systems and also with uh, digital systems. So this is not just a smart city, it's also a city where humans and nature are in a symbiosis. This city actually starts as a horticultural show and then it will become a green city center. And every building has a partner and uh, that's a plant, like the sports center will have the birch tree as a plant. We are trying to transform the skyscraper, and uh, we just had a very nice lecture as well about skyscrapers, so I feel now a bit bad to actually talk about this. But we built one in Lego, so you see here, this is a Lego tower, 
And in terms of urban scale, the skyscraper is not performing very well. It basically sucks the life out of the city. You get in, you can go up and down, you look out. You probably don't know your neighbors because they also look out. Everybody with its back to each other. But if we just change one of these Lego stones, we could have something really interesting. Now, can you see that? It's a bit wobbly, but it's there. So actually now you have an outside space. You can go outside, you can have a barbecue. And while you have a barbecue, can you can look back to the building and you say hi to your neighbors. And now suddenly we have a European skyscraper, a skyscraper that has human scale by just changing one little block. And then we change more because we have these cool computer uh, softwares and then we change a lot more and then we end up with towers like this. We had to build it in Lego, of course, so Lego sent us one million Lego stones. And this tower actually has the quality of an Italian mountain village. It's exactly what you want to have. You have piazzas, outside spaces, you can have uh, an apple tree and everything. So that's nice. So we built more with this one million Lego stones and sometimes you need to just innovate without being hindered whether you can realize it or not. Uh, it's sometimes it's really important to think out of the box and not uh, think about, can we pay this? So we did that. And then we, we had these 16 towers and they weren't enough, so we started to script a little bit more and then a little bit more and then we had this field of 360 towers and then we built them in Lego, so Lego sent us another million Lego stones. They're now still at Delft University. And uh, so basically we, we created the, the European tower with all the European qualities that you might want to have. An open, porous tower that brings life into the city. And then we tried to build them. Now this one, we won the competition in Jakarta, but it didn't happen yet. Who knows, maybe it will one day. But this skyscraper in Rotterdam is going to be built. And here every apartment is unique. And it's for the middle classes. So now with the scripting software we can actually make it happen. And it has qualities and you can see your neighbors and you can say hi. And uh, there will be like a community in this building. And this is not ours. This is actually the most expensive uh, building in Germany. They wanted to sell it for 14,000 euro per square meter. And then the developer went bankrupt because basically even rich people thought this was not a uh, such a nice design. It's just a box. Who would want to live in a box just looking outside? So when we were asked to make a high-end tower for Amsterdam, we thought, how can we do this better than these guys? So then uh, we went into scripting. We looked into qualities. We said every apartment should have the maximum daylight, a garden, and a good view. And then you see here the, the 80 different scripts of only one tower. It's three towers. The red ones, they don't work. The green ones work very well. And actually, there are only two or three really dark green ones that are quite perfect. So this is how we uh, conceived this building, by having rules made in scripting, and an architect would have done a year over this probably in the old times. And this is how we're building it. It's now under construction in Amsterdam. It's a, a retail plint, then we have uh, three layers, and four layers of uh, large-scale offices for tech companies. In 20 years, when the lease stops, we can actually con transform them into uh, apartments. And then on top, we have, uh, we have apartments and uh, it's all very green. The city wanted to have public space in this development and it's very important that the city comes with conditions, that the city is in control and makes the city nicer. And here you have the public space so you can walk on stairs all the way up around the central tower and you have lots of cafes and restaurants on your way. So this is nice. And this is the valley and here you have a green valley. And of course it has labels and yes, they are important for marketing but they also force us to actually apply them. So we, we didn't have the active uh, house yet, but uh, who knows what we can do. And here we have the dream then. This is the dream of suburban life. Yeah, you have a barbecue with friends on top of Amsterdam's central business district. So this is really what we want. This is not what we want. This is a new, uh, uh, well, a new neighborhood in, uh, in Frankfurt, and we think it, it, it lacks quality. Uh, you put people into boxes then you put them into this master plan that actually looks like Soviet uh, master planning. And then we have these people who, who have to go in there and who have to pay all their life for it because in Soviet times at least you would get them and here you have to pay uh, 30 years of mortgage. Will he do that? I don't think he deserves it. And uh, so when we were asked to do 3,500 apartments in Bordeaux, we looked at this uh, brownfield, we used this uh, existing structure 
made a lot of uh, um, volumes, very small streets, intimate streets, and then a very simple uh, thing, we put some parametric design over the roofs so that you have uh, two hours of sun even in winter in the, gr in the ground floor. And then we have this crazy roofscape suddenly and uh, the buildings that come out, they, they look kind of old fashioned, but also modern. So this is this new part of Bordeaux where you have parametric uh, urbanism applied and uh, nobody can get rid of the tower. The tower is then part of uh, the building. So they cannot sa uh, save money by actually cutting off the tower because it's an urban regulation now. And uh, there you have a very nice uh, si urban space with uh, small streets, friendly to people. And this is perhaps more what the new generation could, could enjoy, to live in a, in a green piece of city that has the quality of the medieval city, but it has also the quality of the modern city with more light and more friendly surroundings. And that's Bordeaux. And here you see the cut. This cut actually makes sure that this apartment has enough light. And then could you just stack these dream houses on top of each other? Uh, sometimes we try and in, in Montpellier they didn't think it was uh, appropriate, they thought it was too loud. But then uh, we, we really like this. Can, can you imagine that everybody designs their own house? So we made this uh, Ego City project at Delft University. We said, okay, we have uh, 17 architects and we have 17 clients, egos. And you have a desperate housewife in there, the big Lebowski and Marilyn Manson. And the students were thinking about what's the dream house of Marilyn Manson? And what's the dream house of this guy who loves uh, roller coasters? Of course, a house with a roller coaster. And then they made these houses and then we put them into a computer program and they pixelated it. So these are the volumes of the houses. They look a bit weird, but uh, it's okay. And then we put them into a software and the software then mediates between all these different houses. So nobody should lose too much, but there is a little bit of compromise, but then it fits into a box. The box is important, right? It's cheaper to build. So here we get uh, this uh, mediation process, and in the end, we succeeded to put all the dream houses into a box. And then we go from, from ego to we go. And this is we go city. And uh, uh, it's, it's, it's lovely, crazy, it's still a slap. And uh, it's nearer than you think, because with all this new software, we can actually build these things much easier these days. We, al we already built one at uh, Dutch Design Week, and it was occupied by students for, for a week. And uh, it's all MDF, so not very green, but uh, uh, it's still there, so we'll probably build it again. Maybe you want it in Kiev. <laughs> <coughs> and the next step, that's even cooler. So imagine that we now, uh, this is now something designed by people. But this building is, is empty all day because people go to work and then the building is empty. What if the building would just morph into an office? What if we would just uh, get rid of concrete, glass and steel? Steel is the future. What if the future would be nanotech and we would have all this cool stuff that would, uh, would yeah, t develop around us? So you leave your house in the morning and your house disappears because the, the nanotech that uh, is made that is uh, that basically uh, shapes your house is then turned into an office. So you would have a fully adaptable city. Now that's a bit science fiction, but science fiction is really necessary because we, we already learned that Nike has cool sneakers now because of a science fiction movie. So sometimes you need to think really far ahead to come to com some kind of uh, innovation. And sometimes it's much easier and much more low tech. So we are also trying to transform the car city Cars, we all love them, we are all addicted to them, we can't really do without them, but sometimes it's necessary. So this is the city center of Seoul, or it was it, and they had this, uh, they had this motorway uh, going right through it over Central Station, and the mayor hated it and he wanted to close it, and he had a good moment when uh, it was necessary for, to have a maintenance. And he didn't want to spend the money on the maintenance, but he wanted to spend the money actually on turning it into a park. So he invited architects to come up with ideas and uh, he said, I want a High Line like they have in New York, but I don't want a New York High Line. I want a Seoul High Line. I want something really specific for Seoul. And we thought, okay, a linear park in Seoul, what can we do? Data, we love data. So we, we just made a barcode of all the plants that grow in Seoul from A to Z in the Korean alphabet. You can then walk over this linear park 
and visit that all. And then we didn't have the uh, luxury of just putting soil on this bridge because it was too weak, so we had to work with flower pots. And the flower pots also became street furniture. So library, cafe, uh, pond, all kinds of uh, small things. And then we put it out over this uh, bridge. And this is how Seulo happened and was realized. It wasn't too expensive even, and it's quite successful. So now suddenly there's some green in this uh, piece of town in, uh, in Seoul, some windows that you can still see the traffic underneath you. And uh, it's generally a nice place. It's used by one million people every month, so it's quite successful. And of course, it's Asia, so everybody takes selfies, hundreds and hundreds of selfies every month, which is also quite important nowadays that uh, shows. But in, in the back, you see that it's quite green. And then it has a really interesting economic effect. All the buildings around it, they, s they suddenly started to become expensive, more expensive. So there was a, an economic evaluation of the uh, impact of this uh, park. And actually, removing the motorway brought more value to the buildings. Because normally, a building owner would say, oh, if you remove the street and the parking, it will be less worth. But now here, it was actually the other way around. The building is more worth because uh, there are now one million pedestrians in front of it. And we faced the same uh, question when we were asked to make a master plan for the biggest urban uh, development of Norway in its history. 360,000 uh, square meter of mixed use. That's not a lot in other countries, but in Oslo that was really massive. And the city was really scared of this big development. They thought, oh dear, we're going to have so much traffic, we're going to have such a, a nasty impact on the city center. How are we going to deal with this? And then the, the very obvious idea was to maybe don't put any parking spots into this plan. The developer was, of course, very scared. Oh, the tenants, the tenants. The city said, yeah, yeah, you're right, the tenants. So what did they do? The developer and the city, they went together uh, to the, the tenants. And the biggest tenant is actually in this building here. This is the DNB bank, and they were going to occupy three of the plots of this master plan. And the director of the bank said, I see your problem. And I like the solution. So from now on, I will come by train. And so if the director of Norway's biggest bank says it, he gives the example, and then all his employees couldn't do anything less. And because of that, all the other companies also came overboard. Everybody agreed that this master plan in the city center next to Central Station should not have any parking. And that is the effect. So basically, we have these, uh, this amount of jobs and apartments we have hardly any parking spots, and we save per year 23 million kilometers of traffic in the city. And the buildings were cheaper too, because you don't have to build this parking space underneath. So it's a win-win-win situation for everybody, actually. And also, if you take the public transport and not your car, you get a bit thinner, which is also good. So really a good thing. So the city liked this, and then they asked us, well, until the year 2030, Oslo will grow with one million people, can we solve uh, this problem with less infrastructure? Because we, they, they thought they had to build 40% extra infrastructure. So what we did, we looked at the metro stations that were not so densely uh, built up around. We drew a circle of five minute walking, and then we looked what can we densify and how many square meters can we add around each of these metro stations. And then uh, after we crunched all the figures, we came to the conclusion that without new infrastructure, Oslo could actually build all this uh, growth. It can build 500,000 dwellings for one million new citizens without new infrastructure. It would get a bit more busy in the metro trains, but not too crazy. So it's all possible. If you just steer the development in a different way, if the city has a vision, it can actually do things like that. Now, and then uh, it, it became a bit nasty for us because they asked, okay, what about suburbia? You're all about densification and you want to make the city smaller. Can you also do something about suburbia? And the problem was Almere. That's a new town just outside of Amsterdam. Has a lot of space, really a lot of space. Amsterdam is really full, doesn't have a lot of space. They're building towers now, which is a new thing for, uh, for Amsterdam. But you see the problem, the city is really full. And then on the other side, nobody wants to live here. And it's now used as agricultural farmland. So how do you get the people to, be there, uh, to live there? And how do, you, um, how do you turn this into a good suburb, not a bad suburb? Okay, so that was the, that was the task. And we, s we, we looked at SimCity, the computer game, and we thought maybe we could do some urban planning like a game. 
So we apply a certain um, percentage. So you can have a little bit of building, streets, uh, public green, and then agriculture, as much agriculture as possible, at least 50% or more. So this neighborhood should still produce food. And then we said, okay, in order to get the people there, we have to, we have to use a trick. But here's what you can do. You can do it either alone, apply this percentage, or you can do it with many more people, find each other on a web forum. Okay, and how do you get these people there? You offer freedom and liberty, because in the Netherlands we have so many regulations, it's really tough if you do want to do something special. So what we did here, the city of Almere abandoned all regulations in terms of construction. So now if a new building needs to come, they send an inspector to check the safety, but they don't care about the construction laws anymore. And then here is what's happening, so you get more space for less money. You get a lot, uh, a lot of space for less money. But then the city doesn't see why the city should be responsible to build a road for you. So the question then to you is, if you get all this public uh, land for so little money, then you have to take responsibility. You have to build your own road, you have to build your own electricity, you have to build your own water. If you want a school or a bus, do it yourself. It doesn't work for everybody, and you have the liberty to go elsewhere. But if you want to live there, with all the liberties, you also have to take responsibility. And this is how, uh, how we, we thought about it. So you can actually then just do whatever you like. You have to be nice to your neighbors, so that's one of the main uh, rules. And this is how Almere Osterwald started. There are now 150 houses realized, and it will be 15,000. And here you see the kind of people that come, uh, uh, dog lovers with chicken, with food production, very important. And the, the roads, they have to learn to build roads together in communities. They, have to uh, they had to learn how to talk to the electricity company and the water company. And most of the houses are off the grid because these companies, they don't want to talk to private people. Here's a vineyard. That's the school. It's just uh, opened in a tent. That's the school toilet. It's attached to a filter, so it's a very high, highly sophisticated system underneath, but uh, uh, the toilet itself doesn't look so sophisticated. Now, imagine in highly regulated uh, Netherlands, that's a school toilet. That's really special. Now, this guy lives now in a park. He always wanted to live in a park all his life. Now, he just built himself a park, put his house in, and now everybody is welcome in his garden. And then you can do everything you want in terms of architecture. There is absolutely no rule, whatever. If you want to live traditional, fine. And if you want to live in your camper van and you want to build yourself an indoor camping spot, that's also fine. That's what these people did. They, they love to live in the camper and that's how they, uh, how they created their own life in Almere. I take you to Rotterdam, post-industrial city. It was a very successful medieval city, then it became a trading port and then the Second World War actually uh, yeah, destroyed the city center. This is the market area just after the war. And then after the war, they rebuilt the city, rather modern, uh, only 20,000 inhabitants in the city center, a lot of retail and offices, but no life. Tough. How to change this? So the city noticed if they put a market, an outside market on this space, then suddenly there is a lot of life. So in 2004, the city had the idea to actually have an outside, uh, a covered market, all the time open to live, an up, to live up the, um, the city center. And then they, they didn't have money, so they wanted investors to, uh, to solve this problem. One of the investors called us and said, yeah, we need to build a market for the Netherlands. Okay, we don't have markets in the Netherlands that are covered. Shall we go to Spain and check how they do it? Learn from the professionals, yes. What did we learn? We learned how to stage food. It needs to look really great. We also learned that if you close down a market hall, you close down the neighborhood. So that was not a good thing. Needed to be open all the time. We also learned that uh, this kind of messy market is working for Spanish people, doesn't work for Dutch people. We are much more clean and we don't want to have a low ceiling. So then uh, Vinnie Maas uh, had his first wine in a bistro or something and he started to draw this thing. So we have a cathedral for food and on top you have apartments. Wow. So the developer thought, wow, we have a winner. We're going to build this thing. He went to The Hague uh, home to uh, talk to his colleagues. They said, no way, way too expensive. You can't do that. Okay, so what can we do? So the developers made themselves a financial model, said we can have a rental uh, slab and a condo slab, and that has to pay for the market hall, so we make the market hall as small as possible. 
I said, okay, that's troublesome because you're not going to win the uh, competition with this. The city of Rotterdam really wants to have architectural quality, how to deal with this. But okay, so we built a model and models are really important because you can play with them. And if you then have a model of this, you can also turn it around. I said, hey, that's interesting. Can you still afford it if we do this? Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe. They calculated, said, okay, we, we could afford it. So basically what we do, we use the walls. We make walls by using apartments and we have a roof made out of penthouses. And then suddenly we have a huge space, 40 by 40 meters, 120 meters deep, just like that, for free, as byproduct. That's nice. Okay, bit round, yeah, but problematic with the elevator, so elevator back in, and then a bit more money for the retail downstairs, plop, and suddenly we had this shape. And this is how it was built in a very economic uh, way. So um, it's actually two buildings that can stand up all by themselves until the top uh, connected with a bridge. And this is how Market Hall Rotterdam was, uh, was made and built, opened in 2014. I'll walk you through it. So we have 100 market stalls. They're all very different and all very exciting. And then uh, you yeah, also lots of restaurants, a lot of hipsters we have in Rotterdam. Um, this is the interior, beautiful art piece. The art piece is very important. We had to have a really big window. We didn't want to have any structure in the window. Therefore, we used um, steel cables. It works like a tennis racket. In between the glass, it's actually silicon, so it's even flexible. So if there's a bit of wind, it can move if necessary. And it's single glazed so that it doesn't uh, reflect too much. So you that you can see the art piece inside. It also meant that we couldn't heat up the interior because then you would have uh, water against the glass. That's nice because we could actually get Briam very good with this uh, building by not heating or cooling the interior. The fresh air just comes in underneath the glass facade and leaves all by itself without any help through the, wind, uh, through the roof. It's like a fireplace, very simple system. Low tech, extremely low tech and very low budget. And then you have uh, lovely apartments, they all have an outside to the, to the city and half of them also have a window to the market. So you can live with the market in view. And uh, very nice apartments, half of them are actually social housing, so for the, for the lower middle class. And this, for example, is a social house and these people, they look into the market hall like an inverted uh, attic. And then the rich people, of course, always, they live on top. This is Nicole <laughs> with her dog. And she has a very nice apartment on top and uh, she, she has a window to the market uh, where she can walk on. So for PR reasons, we use the baby to show that it's perfectly all right. But uh, 45 meters below you is the market and uh, you, can, uh, you, can, you can see how busy it is and how to shop. So it was opened in 2014. But what was really interesting was the effect on the city it had, this building. And we heard a lot about that already. This is national television and they said, come to Rotterdam. And they estimated that maybe because of this building, we would have in the city 50,000 extra visitors. Wow. And then we thought, this is great. That's a lot of attention. Um, maybe we could invite the queen. You don't have a royal family in Ukraine, but I can uh, tell you it's a good thing to have them because they attract a lot of attention. So normally the queen would only um, open a museum and not a market, but this one she liked. So she, she came, actually, again in on television with the building. And then she came, she opened the building, our mayor happy, the architect happy, and uh, she opened the building like a princess with the pumpkin, Cinderella. The developers very, very happy, good moment. And then what was also very nice about that moment, the people of Rotterdam, they were outside, they had to wait 10 years for this building, and now they wanted to see it. So they came in, all the doors broke, all the escalators broke, and it was really full. And then in the first year we had 9 million visitors and ever since we have 8 million visitors. And because of the Queen, we had 450 journalists in, in the building, which is great. So get a royal family, you can certainly find some. Maybe the Brits have some uh, people left. And then suddenly they compared the Markthal to Bilbao Guggenheim. And we thought that wasn't fair because Markthal is a private investment. It was not built with taxpayers' money. So the, the it was an honor to be compared with the Bu Guggenheim, but on the other hand, also kind of weird. And here you see how full it is, and now we have like 8 million uh, visitors every year. Half of them come from uh, uh, abroad, which is very nice. 
and then we have uh, them for 45 minutes in, on average in the building. So people stay really long in the building because many people just come in and out for a few apples. But this is uh, really cool. And this means that the city of Rotterdam that was famous for right-wing politicians, for drugs, hooligans, suddenly became number five in, uh, in the Lonely Planet. Wow, that was really crazy. Um, we hadn't expected that. And ever since, we are on these top ten lists all the time, all these media, and uh, the city has really changed. 25 years of urban planning happened without anybody noticing, and then suddenly this building was there. Tourists came, went into the building, and then they had to, they, they stayed there maybe two hours, then they walked into the city and they saw that a lot had changed and that Rotterdam was a nice place. So it's not just the building, but the building helped to attract the people. But uh, yes, I think my time is up. Shall I stop? I'll take, time. I'll take my time. Okay. Well, then what's next in Rotterdam? How do we keep uh, attracting visitors? It's a democratic project, transforming art storage. So we have this museum in Rotterdam and it has some really cool pieces of art, by Breugel, for example, and then they have a really big storage space underneath. And every time it rains in summer, it floods. So this is the museum director uh, in protest that his valuable art, you can see it here, gets really wet. There's a, I think there was a Dali inside, so not, not ideal. So the city paid for a new uh, depot, um, but the director had a plan. He wanted to have a depot that was actually open to everybody. Because what's happening, only 4% of the art is visible and 96% is in the depot. And it's the municipal art collection, so it is owned by the people of Rotterdam and they can never ever see the art. So he said, okay, let's make it visible, let's build something. And they invited architects to, uh, to a competition. This site, right next to the museum, in the city center, in a park, you can imagine there was a lot of public participation. People don't want buildings in parks normally. Also here, that was the case. So we, had to, we needed to leave this uh, route open, and here we had to bi build this uh, building. No basement. He, he had like a trauma about basements because they get wet, so he wanted to have it all up there, 15,000 uh, square meters. Okay, we made a design, a table, the art all the way up there, safe from the water, and then they told us that we could pay only the steel with the budget we had said, okay, so what can we do? So we took the most simple shape and tested it with the, with the cost uh, uh, analysis. And the thing was, uh, everything was too expensive. And if you, had a, if you were overspending, you would be disqualified from the competition. So then we had a problem because this cube was actually too, too expensive. And what was expensive? The facade was expensive because it had to uh, not only be heavily insulated, but also an anti-burglar uh, concrete kind of uh, thing where you had to hammer it for five minutes without having even an, an inch uh, in there. So how to deal with it? And then at a certain moment, somebody developed the idea to make it round because then you have less facade. Okay, we make it round. Then we make it a bit smaller below so that you don't destroy the park so much. We have a big roof terrace then suddenly, which is nice. You can uh, look all the way around it. Then it reflects the garden. We said, okay, we built in a park. Why don't we have a reflective facade so that the building is almost like disappearing? And that has very nice effect that you can look around the corner, that the volume dissolves towards the top where it uh, reflects the, the sky. And then at night, the building reveals the interior and it's gonna look like this during daytime and then it gets dark. You see some of the windows behind the, the facade. There's a park and the trees had to be removed. So they have been moved to a tree asylum where they wait until the roof is ready and then we move them back onto the roof actually. Uh, it cost one million extra to have a lot of uh, soil up there, but it did work. And now we have this building and it will be open so people from 2020 onwards can go in and they see everything that the citizens of Rotterdam own in terms of art. It will be an art storage. So a lot of art will be visible, not really uh, yeah, sorted uh, in, in themes, but in, in, in the way of how to use store art. And then this is, for example, very nice. So you can go into the most uh, 
protected art uh, environments in the into the storages, 15 people, 11 minutes, and then you have to run out again, switch the lights off so that the art doesn't uh, decline. And then lots of uh, flexible spaces where uh, all kinds of things can happen, so it's, it's not uh, going to be a normal exhibition space, but it's a space where you can actually see how they prepare exhibitions and uh, how you can learn about art storage. And then on top there's a restaurant, and this is very important. In the Netherlands, museums are really expensive, like 10 euros uh, per person. So for a family, it's then cheaper to go a day to IKEA than to go to the museum. But the rooftop will be uh, freely accessible for everybody, which is also kind of dem democratic and very nice. And there you have a sculpture garden overlooking the city. And it's now in a construction. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. That was uh, fascinating. Very uh, interesting presentation with amazing storytelling sort of sequence. Uh, for me, the most interesting part was uh, when you mentioned um, the, the pro well, I mean, obviously the process of design and the stories behind the, the buildings that you make. But uh, the most interesting part was um, your comment about model making, how models would actually reveal something new to you. And uh, it was clear to me from the beginning, before you actually mentioned the model of the actual uh, restraints that you had to work with, with the two towers and the uh, penthouses in the center, uh, when you were talking about the generative models that you were making, and that's uh, definitely, uh, you know, uh, a sort of emerging technology of the future of design, and new designers are actually using those uh, computational uh, algorithms to generate variations of the same model or the same idea, and uh, you mentioned a very interesting comment uh, where it would take a year for an architect to design all these uh, towers from which you can choose from, which uh, would take a couple of days for an algorithm to run. So uh, my question to you, I guess, would be um, how seriously do you take this process at uh, MVRDV? Is it actually part of the uh, planning process or the sort of sketching process? Or is it still a sort of a more modernist approach where Winnie Moss would be sitting having a glass of wine and sketching something on a napkin and then you know, send it over to the guys at the office and, and let's make it a building? Because it seems like uh, that's kind of not the case anymore, is it? No, no. The, the, the the genius that makes a sketch and it's going to be built, that's not happening. I also showed you the sketch because it didn't happen. It, it, uh, it was uh, maybe more like an art piece rather than, than a building that was uh, possible there. So we, we have teams and we work in teams that uh, conceive architecture. So who, who has the idea is not clear. It's MVRDV, it's us as a, as a team. And even if we have computer models and even if we have all the software, even then, we still build a physical model and put it on the table because then everybody can talk about it. Mm. It's a social process to make architecture. And we also invite all the, the consultants, like uh, the engineers, they come, the fire department, whatever. They're all around the table and they can say something about this, uh, this model. Very important. Even if we have uh, made it in an algorithm, then after that, somebody goes to the model shop and builds the model so that we can discuss it, whether it's, uh, it's working. And it's so simple. I mean, we have all the, the, the gadgets in the office, so you can go through virtual reality and look at the building from the inside. But still, if you have the model in your hand and you see it, it really adds something that, uh, that virtual reality doesn't I definitely provide. agree. Mm. And, and with uh, 3D printing, you can actually 3D print all the variations that you have exactly. in a few hours without so having to make all of them. Yeah. But also what's interesting is using the Lego blocks in your uh, initial... Uh, sort of proposal. Were the Lego blocks a scaled sort of version of a material or a, a unit or uh, something that you had in mind? Or was it uh, like a sort of voxel that you're designing with? Is it, you know, a, a yeah, sort of restraint no. that is the, uh, in the scaled beginning? in real life? So we, we actually designed once this, uh, this building for the Norwegian bank and it's a pixel uh, based on the ideal work group of the bank, which is a six by six meter space. And that was uh, square, and then we could actually work with Lego to make lots of variations. That was before we had the software. So then Lego was much easier. And then once we had the software and we did all this research, we still used Lego because then we could build it very simply. But uh, so yes, um, you scale it up to a certain degree. 
Amazing. One more question. Sorry, this is just so interesting for, for me to see the work. Uh, this is kind of like a, I was just uh, interested to know for the last project, the market hall, um, the units in the center for the penthouses right at the top, you know, how do you get natural light in there? Well, there's a light court, courtyard yeah. in the center. Which is the market. Um, no, uh, from the roof, so the roof has gaps and there is a courtyard and you have uh, the living room and two of the bedrooms around it. And some people even have a bathroom so they, they can, because it's total pri privacy, it's almost like a Roman villa on top of the city where you can, uh, can be in your bathroom naked in the sun without anybody seeing it. So it's really comfortable and nice. But this courtyard still comes with the window so you have also some daylight in the market hall. Mm. And if you walk over it, then uh, people can see you downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Not from a very flattering uh, point of view. Uh. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. Do you guys have any questions for Jan? Okay, can you please step here? Anyone who has questions, please uh, step behind the gentleman. Okay. Hi, Jan. It was a fascinating presentation. Uh, I have a question. It's more of a... What are, I noticed that uh, there was a lot of beautiful images of buildings uh, with uh, outdoor green spaces and kind of pri uh, private spaces, but also some public spaces. Uh, what are the challenges of achieving such, uh, of these, these type of outdoor spaces and um, how do you go, go about uh, making it happen? Because I can imagine that there's a whole maintenance plan behind it people from the, uh, who are own the building, uh, they probably have to pay a large amount of money to make sure that the, the green stays green. And so it's just what are the challenges to having this done and how do you achieve it? Well, the, the Valley, this uh, high-end building in Amsterdam with all the greenery, um, um, an architecture critic received a critic award by trashing the building saying that it can't be done because uh, the green will probably not grow. That's the general idea. But uh, so the challenge was to actually have uh, enough soil uh, on the balcony so that uh, there is enough uh, earth that the roots can, uh, can really uh, root in there. And the other challenge is to, to pick the right plants because up there, even in Amsterdam, it's quite alpine. So there's a lot of uh, wind and uh, sun, it's dry. And so how do you keep them alive? For that we have uh, engaged Pete Audolf, the uh, landscape designer, and he made an overall plan in different climate zones for the building, and then it will be maintained by one gardener. And this, this is a really high-end development, and uh, so therefore they can pay the gardener. But you also made, might uh, remember the Bosco Verticale in Milano as by uh, Stefano Boeri. I think that's not a very expensive building, and it still grows, so it's, it's really, you have to think about where are the plants in terms of the building. And also here, um, you can actually script it because you can test how much rain, water uh, comes in. You can test how much sun and wind is there. So, but uh, these are kind of really big challenges. With the museum, the challenge was that we wanted to have really real-sized trees. So there was also a, a storm threat. The, the storm could just basically remove the trees from the roof. So we needed one and a half meters of, uh, of uh, earth. So that was uh, a bit expensive, but then you get real trees instead of uh, yeah, some, some shrubs. Sure. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, thank you so much, Jan. Thank you. It was fascinating. <laughs>